Okay, so we got our week two all laid out for us. He's in the lab a lot, and he doesn't uh, volunteer, so I don't actually have any volunteering yet. I'll see if Sherry starts yelling at me. I don't know how important the, volu the whole volunteer aspect is. I might put it in later just because I'm scared out of my mind. Hey, we got a half heart with Kyler. Your friendly neighborhood geologist who loves helping out. All right. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Stats. Okay, let's start. In earnest. Oh, chocolate hazelnut. You're worth the extra insulin. When I was done, I rolled the bread up and bit the end. My mouth glued shut as I chewed while the spread smeared my cheek. Glad I was eating breakfast alone. I was being sloppy. Bonjour. Huh? Someone lightly pecked me on one cheek. The person immediately pulled back and I hastily rubbed my face while he did the same. Ugh, DeAndre! I was stuffing my face! At least warn me next time before you kiss me. I could see the same. What was with the kiss, anyway? It's how we greet friends. Usually the cheek kissing goes a little smoother than this one. He eyed my breakfast and snorted teasingly. <laughs> Cute, Mel. Hey, I wasn't expecting everyone to arrive so soon. Did you drive here? We took the train. It only stops here every half an hour, so you either arrive early or slightly late. Before I could question the we, DeAndre tapped the side of his cheek. Um, you still have some. You too. Still? Did you dunk your face into- I did not! Your timing was just atrocious. While we were both cleaning ourselves, I noticed Kyler observing us with a deadpan expression. He frowned in disgust and disappeared around the corner with his belongings. Ugh. <sighs> DeAndre rubbed his temples like he had an impending headache. I don't think he likes me. Hmm? Something happened? Well... Do you remember that rowdy night? The one I passed on? Did I miss out on something? Uh, we were partying and some of us had gotten rather tipsy and started playing catch. I may or may not have nailed Kyler in the head with the ball. Was he okay? Yeah, he was fine, if upset. I tried to apologize, but he wouldn't hear of it. Now he probably thought I was shamelessly flirting with you like some full-time playboy. Oh, you aren't? Part-time. Kyler seems to be the type where first impressions are everything. I think you're right. He seemed to tolerate me once he learned I was serious about archaeology. Oh yeah, you two work in the same location. About the ball incident. Are you still gonna apologize? I'll try. Not many opportunities to actually talk to the guy. Still, it was an accident. I wonder why he reacted like that. I think because it could have damaged the device he wears. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Hope he'll forgive you now. Hope the sneeze goes away, too. Please go away, sneeze. I don't need you right now. A few other students trickled in and I finished my breakfast before there were any more mishaps. Anyway, where did you stay this weekend? I furiously chewed my oversized portion, but DeAndre flashed me a patient, I'll wait smile. <coughs> Simply tapped the table since I couldn't talk. Here, how was it? I survived. <laughs> when a car pulled in, I knew Augustan and Sherry had arrived. I waved to them as they got out, although inwardly I wanted to whine to Augustan about the whole ghost thing. After Sherry and I greeted each other, she handed my journal back. Be sure to read the comments in the journal when you have time. It'll give you an idea of how you're performing. Thank you, I will. Also, since this is your second week here, you now have the option to pick lab work if you'd like. Oh, right. I'll notify Hendrick. He handles the Lab 101 here and can explain the procedures to you. Nice. It seems my options have opened up. Huzzah. There sure are a lot of stuff and tools here. I perked up as Hendrik tapped the whiteboard with his prosthetic fingers, his speech continuing in French. His lecture was occasionally interrupted with polite giggles or groans, and he would grin at their reactions. Hendrik loved to deliver puns in any language, I mused. Once the explanation wrapped up, people collected plastic bags, each with a sheet inside. Some barely contained any material, while others had huge bones encased in tin foil. I grabbed a decently sized one with mostly smaller items, and fished out the fiche along with a wrapped item. 
Is this your first time doing lab work? Yes, Sherry's gone over the procedures with a slide presentation, but it's different seeing it all up close. If you'd like, I can clarify a few things. I thought it'd be easier to do a little one-on-one -on -one instead of repeating myself in both languages and taking up more time. Really? Then... Since you put it as one-on-one, -on -one, let's go through these things so we get more Hendrick time. Can you break down the lab process in its simplest form? Clean objects. Document them. Repeat. That's it. That's it. That was sure short and sweet. When you've worked with many students with varying degrees of interest in archaeology, it helps to be concise. It's my own take on the KISS principle. Keep it simple for students. I'll have to try a different KISS principle later. <laughs> There's so many tools used to clean. What's the general routine? He leaned over and pointed to the plastic bowl with a sieve placed over it. Depending on how dirty the item is, use this to wash the majority of the soil off. If it's a bone, please don't let it stay submerged for too long, or it'll become saturated. It will end up damaging the object, especially if it's already cracked or flaky. Other times, you simply need to dunk a brush into the water if you're only cleaning a small section. Be sure to dry it thoroughly using a paper towel or lint-free cloth. Whether you use that step or not, it's on to using brushes and craft sticks. I know about brushes, but craft sticks? They're great for scraping muck off without scratching the remains. I'm partial to craft sticks myself, but everyone has their own preference. If you use a brush, be gentle and don't scrub too hard. And there are toothpicks, which are useful for cleaning teeth or porous items. If the object is relatively clean to begin with and doesn't need water, you can simply brush the dirt off. Be careful, though. Some bones are too fragile to wash or clean. Use your judgment. There'll be a little trial and error at first, but you'll get the hang of it. Don't worry, I won't get upset if a bone falls apart. Says the geologist. What if I drop a rock? Handle those with extreme care, please. I will, promise. Why a nip pen, cousin? I picked up the ink bottle and gave him an uncertain look. Why these? It looks like it'll be a messy process, and I have never used a nib pen before. It stays on the bone or stone better than a regular ink pen, regardless of surface, and you have better control over the writing. I'm terrible at describing how to use one. I think if you hold it slightly lower than a regular pen and lightly pull, the ink should flow out evenly. Obviously don't dunk the nib into the ink bottle like cookies and milk. Also follow the number style I've written on the board. I turned my head, studying the 1 to 9 that went down in a vertical column. The 3 was flat at the top, and the 7 had an extra line in the middle of it. The 1 had a little hook at the top with a foundation. Is it to keep everything more consistent? That and we don't panic if a number fades. See... He approached the board and wrote a bubbly 8. He then wiped half of it, turning it into a 3. This is why. Same with a 7. If we lose a part of it... We won't mistake it for a 1 due to the line in the middle. It's extremely important to be able to identify its number. When you're, when, you're when you're done jotting down the fiche number in year, don't forget to coat it with a thin layer of clear nail polish to protect the ink. Make sure you let the ink dry first or it'll become all blurry. What happens if I mess up? I have a feeling whiteout won't help here. Ah, then this is the fun part. You can use the nib to scrape, scrap off the ink. I don't recommend using it multiple times over the same surface, though. Then you'll end up destroying the very item we're trying to preserve. What if the object is impossible to write on due to its size? Then place it in the tray cup along with the written piece of paper that came with it. Although, try your best to write in a partial line, since it's possible to lose the paper over time. Please write neatly so I don't end up cursing your name next year when I get around to them. Mm-hmm. Can you sum up each tool and its use for me? Sorry if there's overlap. It's fine. It's important to clarify. There's the water, the sieve, and the bowl for washing. Other instruments include brushes of various size, craft sticks, toothpicks, cloth and paper towels for drying. And when it's all written down and coated with nail polish, you can drop the items in the cups set up on the trays over there. He pointed to row upon row of wooden trays, each with cups super glued to the surface. Some had bigger containers for the obviously larger objects, too. That way they'll dry it in the sun. I'll take care of everything when the lab work is done, so you don't have to worry about the rest. I 
any other tips? Um, any tricks or tips you can think of off the top of your head? Other than what I've told you? Just be gentle and use your best judgment. Don't mix up the items, please, and be sure to clean up the utensils when you're all done. Isn't it harder to extract DNA after you wash them? Plus, we're touching with our bare hands. Even just breathing while you're digging contaminates exposed material. It's virtually impossible to avoid tainting samples unless you catch it early while excavating. We'd rather have items clean so we can identify their morphology or possible Neanderthal manipulation of these items. Like... Burnt bone, cuts and bone from flint, tool manufacturing... The stuff I hope avoided ended up in the wet screening process and has its context marked and identified on the document. Alright. I think I got everything. Thanks for the help, Hendrik. Keen problem. I'll mostly be helping out in the lab, working alongside the other students. Hendrik drifted away to answer questions from other students while I gingerly unwrapped one of the items in the tin foil. It was a tiny tooth, with only minimal dirt attached to the root. At least it was an easy one to work with. I dunked a toothbrush into the water and began to scrub it. I dried it off and set it on the cloth, then uncapped the ink bottle and neatly dipped the nib into it. Gently, gently... I had barely touched the tooth with the nib when a giant splotch of ink dispersed and penetrated the root. It now resembled a squished black spider. Oh. I cleaned the nib and sc scraped the blotch the best I could. It seemed to work, but it also scratched into the tooth. It's harder than it looks. I'm already missing the cave. Of course, this was where the real discoveries would take place. Where everything was cataloged and identified for future examination. I would also be graded for my lab work, so it wasn't something I could avoid entirely. Time to see if I can finish this one, at least. Alright. We succeeded on our first day at the lab. Ahem. <clears throat> Sorry, I was in the middle of a swallow. What kind of bone is this? A tooth? It was the size of the palm of my hand, with wave-like ridges on the outside. Who should I ask? Hendrik, finally. Hendrik may be a geologist, but he should be familiar with bones, too. Hey, Hendrik, I have a question. Sure, how can I help? Do you know what this is? Hmm? I offered it to him, and he held it up between his finger and thumb, examining it closely. This is... Yes? Not a rock. <laughs> Gosh darn it, Hendrik. He casually dropped it into my outstretched hand. You have no idea. Nope. My expertise lies in geology and geology alone. Um... Sherry? He's not interested in anything that used to be alive. Or still living, for that matter. Oh, no, it was Augustan. Hold on. Gotta do that again with Augustan's voice, because that, that didn't sound right at all. He is not interested in anything that used to be alive, or still living, for that matter. What's that supposed to mean? You know what I mean. You are too absorbed in your work. You never show interest in other people, especially. Uh, Augustan, do you know what bone this is? Uh, you've seen one silly Coelodonta and Ticotati's Opamola. You've seen them all. I see. Thanks? <laughs> oh no, and it's like I should have known this one. Was Augustan trying to say like, you should pay attention to to Rosemary? Really, you guys would make a cute couple. He's like, nope. <laughs> a student raised her hand, and Augustan wandered off to help. Hendrik scratched his cheek sheepishly. Thanks for changing the subject. <laughs> no problem. I had a feeling you didn't want your personal life brought up in front of a student. The perks of working with family. I swear, we're professional most of the time. Oh, and Coladonta Antiquitatus is woolly rhinoceros. Hey, you do know some stuff outside geology. I'm as surprised as you are. I guess I have an inkling of non-geology knowledge buried in my head after all. Look at that. Well done, Hendrik. And well done, Melissa, for changing the subject. Phew. I was braver this time. 
Instead of sitting at the end of the bench, I positioned myself right in the middle, hoping to mingle with other students. I eyed the carton of apple juice that was out of my reach. I did not want to stand up and reach over, since that would seem rude. However, I wasn't sure if I could communicate clearly to the people beside me. It was worth a shot, though, and I did try to brush up on my French when I had the chance. Please, pronunciation, don't fail me now. Um... I hesitantly extended my fingers toward the item. Excusez-moi. Hmm? Pouvez-vous, s'il vous plaît, passer le jus de pomme? The girl clapped a hand to her mouth in shock, then excitedly gestured with one arm in the air. Quoi? Tout le monde! Elle parle français! Peux-tu répéter? Um... Répéter! Repeat! I stammered out the line, but finished strongly. Moments later, everyone applauded. Um, mercy. As the claps died down, I felt a little more welcome here. It was rather encouraging. But it wasn't getting my juice any faster. It seemed my thoughts were heard, and the juice carton appeared beside my plate. I glanced up, and the redhead across from me smiled. Mercy, June. We recognize each other again, and they exchanged a grin. Merci beaucoup. You're welcome. Joan and I met already. I'm Melissa. Chantel, sorry for the spotlight, but I thought a little cheering would help. It's fine. I appreciate it. I poured my drink while Joan eyed me curiously. Chantel, she is from the States. Yep, California to be exact. Beaches, bikinis, movie stars, and all that jazz. To come all this way, you want to be an archaeologist as well? Yes, I jumped at the chance to excavate at a Neanderthal site. I can't exactly do that back home. It's incredible to be surrounded by all this history. What about you two? What degrees are you taking? Chantel translated for me, and Joan brightened as she raised her fingers close to her cheek and wriggled them. Music! I play flute! Neat! How do you say flute in French? <laughs> Chantel managed to relay the question to Joan, who giggled. <laughs> La flute! Why am I not surprised? But isn't that nice? It helps with learning a language if many of the words are identical or similar. If all else fails, say the word in English. There's a chance we might understand. Are you monolingual? Um, well... I'm not sure if it counts, but solo hablo un poquito de español. Joan tilted her head while Chantel leaned in ardently. ¿Hablas español? ¿Me puedes enseñar español? Um, tal vez. Where did you learn it? My parents speak it, and I was much more fluent growing up, but I've sort of gotten rusty. Are you learning Spanish? Chantel pouted between a spoonful of cereal sprinkled with cocoa powder. I'd like to, but Spanish class is conflicted with my other courses. I want to go to South America or the Caribbean, so I'd like to master both English and Spanish. We both glanced back at Joan, who patiently tried to follow along. Chantel quickly summed up our conversation, and Joan nodded. Chantel wants to dig underwater. I'm interested in underwater archaeology. Sadly, this elective is not what I'm looking for, but the choices were pretty limited. I guess the cave can get damp occasionally, if that counts. I admit underwater archaeology was not a field I had given much thought to. Why underwater? Are you... Searching for sunken cities? That's part of it. Well, that and pirates. Pirates have always fascinated me. I'd like to excavate something like Port Royal, the infamous Jamaican city that was partially submerged after an earthquake. There's already been multiple investigations at Port Royal, and it makes me anxious. I really want to start enjoying something amazing like that. I feel by the time I graduate, everything about Port Royal will be studied and then left alone and forgotten like Grot the Spy. I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. Archaeologists rediscovered Pompeii hundreds of years ago, and the excavations are still ongoing. These things take time, like... Kalen, of course. I paused to let Chantel summarize our conversation again. <laughs> Joan responded in a sentence so soft I couldn't catch it. What did she say? Joan says she's a super slow digger in Grotte de Kalen. I know no archaeology. Chantel helps. More like I reassure her I'll help and then wonder if I should bother Mr. Dupont. I'm thankful for Mrs. Keller. She's very patient. And I guess there's Hendrick now too, right? 
He seems pretty approachable. He is, and uh, he's definitely geologisty. Chantal tilted her head toward the far end of the table. I could see him socializing with Sherry and Augustan, obviously playing catch up. And he's Beau, too. He's supervising the labs now. Maybe they won't be so boring this time around. Have you done them yet? Only recently. Sherry encouraged me to focus on the cave last week. The lab's not bad, but there's a lot to take in. I find it tedious. Joan, I'm to le laboratoire. No, no, no. It is tedious. Boring? If you'd like, maybe the three of us could work in the lab together. That'd be fun. Sounds like a plan. Joan picked up her empty plate and I did the same. It was nice talking to you, Melissa. Nice talking to you. I'll see you both later. My grin didn't fade after we parted ways. It felt wonderful to branch out and introduce myself to more people. I finally made some female friends. Why did that take so long, anyway? Indeed. We're spending too much time with the rocks. That's why. That's what's happening. Okay. And we're doing really well. Like, we're hard. I don't think... We haven't failed yet. We have no stress. And I didn't jinx it yet. Still no stress. Oh. There it goes. But the stress is, like, minimal. It didn't even matter that we failed the internet. I can have, like, less internet going into next week. I thought we were going to fail a lot more. Ursus Belaeus. Ursus Belaeus followed by more Ursus Spacius. I thought Sherry was kidding when she said 99% of the bones recovered were cave bear. At least it makes guessing which animal the bone belongs to much easier. I was in the lab sitting next to Shoji while I rummaged through the plastic bag I had selected. Yep, I can feign being an expert on this stuff. Hey, Melissa, what animal does this hoof belong to? Cave bear. Melissa, this horn. Hmm, let me think. Cave bear. <laughs> Shoji glanced at his document and thought as if he wanted to say something but couldn't decide. I'm gonna wait. I want to encourage Shoji as much as I can. I tilted my head, hoping my smile would encourage him to speak up. After a moment, he shyly muttered. Um, Melissa, what about these fossilized feathers? What species is this? Cave bear, of course. Didn't you know? They were capable of flight. And that's why you find them everywhere. <laughs> we shared a final chuckle since the joke had gotten old by then and returned to our tasks. A small gasp caught my attention and I glanced up to see flakes from a cracked canine tooth fall into the paper towel. Shoji looked horrified, then hastily placed the toothbrush down to examine the damage. It was a canine that belonged to a... what else? Cave bear with a giant fracture that ran from part of the tooth to the end of the root. It was drenched in water with some smears of dirt still left on it. Yikes, the condition's bad. It didn't appear that fragile when I washed it. He picked up the enamel pieces and sighed. Aw, oh, did I mess up somewhere? You should help him. How long did you wash it for? Um, just a few minutes? I sort of swirled it around in the water for a bit. Ah, oh, now I see. I think you used too much water. It's saturated and causing the tooth to flake since there's a big crack in it and everything. Maybe let it dry more before cleaning it? You have to be super careful with it now though because of the excess water. I had no idea. I think Hendrik went over it, but... It's a lot to take in. He nodded in agreement. Thanks for that. I'll keep it in mind from now on. It's no problem. This is stuff I need to memorize anyway. I'm still learning, but I'll be happy to help if you have any questions. I'd appreciate it. The excavation team is always busy, and I feel like I'm bothering them. And Professor DuPont scares me. He's friendly, but he can get pretty intimidating when it comes to structure and doing things right. I hope I don't screw up too majorly here. <laughs> a few days ago, one of the students mixed up her buckets. Dupont's lecture echoed throughout the whole cave for 20 minutes. It was really nerve-wracking. I felt bad for her. Whoa, I must have had my earbuds in since I didn't hear any of that. I guess ignorance is bliss. Let's pray for a smooth dig where we don't discover a Neanderthal tooth in our wet screen. At least I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> oh, if only. If only it was that and not burnt flint. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, here we go. Wait, seriously? How did I end up here? I skidded to a halt to get a better idea of my location. My morning jog had been extended way longer than I'd intended. Oh, I'll try this off-road, I said. I won't get lost, I said. The hoodie around my waist had gotten loose and I retied the sleeves while I walked briskly along the street. I was definitely high up. Beside me was a steep slope and I knew the cave was located somewhere below. It's already past eight. I should have found my way back like 20 minutes ago. I sauntered closer to the slope and peered down, wondering if I could find a shortcut. No way! That's the cave down there! It was unmistakable. There was a protruding shed half hidden in the rock and I could see the worn path. I did not see any trail that descended down. Not without weaving through the bushes and trees, anyway. If I backtracked, I would be horribly late. What to do, what to do... We're rational. I'm not gonna say one of us acted rationally. Just go. I really didn't have a choice in the matter, did I? I took one precise step to secure my footing before launching myself, then half slipped, half ran down the slope. Narrowly dodging trees, I stumbled and ended up bursting through a thicket of bushes. Do all these bushes have thorns? What is this? I shielded my face as I ducked under the lower branches. As the walkway came into view, I grabbed a tree trunk to stop my momentum. Huffing and puffing heavily from my detour. <sighs> I emerged from the forest in a less than stellar state, all scratched with leaves stuck to me everywhere. A few curious students glanced up in surprise. When Hendrik noticed their movements, he followed their gaze and gave me a bewildered look. What happened to you? Uh, I took a wrong turn during my jog. I'm still intact, though. <laughs> I hastily brushed off the leaves and plopped down in an empty chair, wanting to drown myself in the work immediately. Um. She tapped her head repeatedly, and I combed my fingers through my hair in response, trying to fix my dishevelment. After a few moments, Joan del delicately reached over and plucked a leaf from my hair. Oh, merci. We exchanged an amused smile, and we silently returned to our tasks. Although we were in the shade, I started to feel unusually warm as time went on. Hmm. I squinted as I struggled to jot down the information on the bone. I wiped my forehead, then paused, surprised by how much sweat had accumulated. It can't be because of the jog. That was hours ago. The pen grazed against the bone and made an illegible squiggle when my hands involuntarily jerked. The trembling didn't stop, and I placed the items down as dread settled in. Crap. I shoved my hands into my pockets, searching for the hard candies I had on me whenever my blood sugar was low. I froze when I realized they were empty, and I frantically patted myself down. I always carried emergency rations on me. How could... Oh no. They must have fallen out of my pocket when I slid down the slope. I shot up, nearly knocking the chair over in my haste. Joan flinched, then put a hand to her mouth when she saw my state. Tay sent to Malad? Uh, sick? Yeah, not feeling well. I need sugar. Confused chatter rose from the table, and Hendrik announced something to calm the students down. However, I was not in the mood to address them, and I strained to recall where I could get something sweet and fast. Wait, the fridge. With semi-shaky legs, I started walking over to the outdoor kitchen, feeling lightheaded. Something warm brushed against my arm, and Joan gently touched my shoulder. You okay? I help? Can you grab some apple juice? Uh, palm juice? Jus de palm? Despite my struggles, Joan understood my request and made a beeline for the kitchen. I decided it was better for me to sit on the bench before the symptoms worsened. I heard DeAndre and Kyler snapping at each other behind the counter. The words were in French, but even I could tell it wasn't friendly banter. Their constant shuffling blocked the path to the fridge, and Joan surveyed the situation. With clenched fists, she impatiently marched over. Bouge de la! Melissa est malade! Oui, madame! DeAndre and Kyler exchanged shocked glances, but shuffled aside to allow Joan through. In her hurry, she fumbled when she grabbed a cup, but regained her movements. After pouring the apple juice, she briskly walked toward me while doing her best to hold the cup steady. DeAndre tried to rush over, but Kyler barked out something harsh. DeAndre resentfully retreated a few steps. Joan sat next to me, making sure my fingers grasped the cup firmly. The rim quivered against my lips, but I was able to take a gulp. The tangy sweetness of apple juice filled my mouth. 
Amidst all this, I could hear Joan talking to Kyler and DeAndre in French, presumably explaining the situation. No one barraged me with questions. As my condition improved, Joan let out a sigh of relief. Whew. And it's a little farther away to give me more room. I licked my lips and wiped my mouth with an arm as I mumbled behind my knuckles. Merci beaucoup. My amount of gratitude could not be expressed in just two words, but I hoped they could sense the heartfelt emotion behind them. You better? Much better. I admit it's been a while since I've had an episode like that. What was that exactly? You looked as if you were going to pass out right then and there. Don't pester her with questions. She's still recovering. The hell, man. Who died and made you boss? Joan waved an arm to get their attention. Comme vous? The tension dissolved and the three looked at me inquisitively. I cradled the cup in my lap as I formulated an answer. I'm okay now. Honest. Um... I guess I should go to the lab because that's where Hendrik was last? Maybe I'll run it in there? I'm going to go inside for a bit. I need air conditioning. Which was true. During that whole episode, I'd been sweating. It would be ideal to get out of the sun. DeAndre and Kyler exchanged glances while Joan was hesitant. Kyler nodded understandingly while the other two were torn with my wish. You'll be fine by yourself? Of course, promise. I'm sure someone will check up on me. That seemed to pacify DeAndre, and he nodded before following Kyler back to the kitchen. Joan stood up and looked at me expectantly. Joan, thanks for grabbing the jus de pomme. I lifted up the cup for clarification, and she nodded eagerly. Uh, Shoji? <laughs> Whoops. Uh, that's not quite right. I'm glad you're okay. I will tell Sherry, though. She should know. That's for the best. Thank you, Joan. She left, and while I forced myself to move, cup in hand. She left, and while I forced myself to move, cup in hand. Okay. Once inside the lab, I slumped down in the nearest seat and sprawled my upper torso across the table. It felt cool to my forehead, and I groaned loudly. Oh. Stupid, 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 stupid. Stupid, stupid. What's stupid? Oh. Hello! <laughs> Hendrik poked in around the door, then approached the table where I could see him. Don't hate me if I repeat an overused question. How are you feeling, Melissa? What happened back there, if you don't mind me asking? The students were all alarmed, but I told them to let you be. I didn't think more crowding would have helped the situation. Right, everyone witnessed my episode. I now wanted to dig a hole and crawl into it. I closed my eyes and moved my face until it touched another cool portion of the table. Sugar levels got low, and I needed something sweet. I'm good now. Says the girl practically plastered to the table. I sat back up to convince him otherwise. Could you do me a favor? Sorry for the inconvenience. By all means, inconvenience me. <laughs> my diabetic bag is in my tent. It's green and should be on my mattress. I'll be needing it. My tent is the yellow one against the building to the left side. Of course. After a few minutes, seconds, he returned, and I started unzipping the bag. Anything else? No, you've done more than enough, Hendrik. Thank you, I can take it from here. Just holler if you need me. With that, he departed, probably to appease the students' concerns. I heard the museum door open, and I expected it to be Hendrik for a split second. There you are! Sorry about not finding you. I needed to get my glucose levels back to normal first. No, I understand. Do you know what caused it? I didn't see you at breakfast. I got lost. Not only did I jog longer than I intended, but I also skipped a meal. This made me sound more and more irresponsible as I went on. And I lost my emergency candy. Please don't fail me. I wouldn't deduct marks for this. Melissa, I think you should get some rest. Let's focus on getting your meal schedule back on track. Right. However, I'd like to talk to you about this later. My shoulders pricked and I could only stammer in agreement. What will she bring up anyway? I hope it's not about monitoring me. Oh, but we do, because we want Hendrik to monitor us this weekend. Finally get to do that after how many times going through this? <laughs> Five?